So we're in Genesis 26. The American Civil War was particularly tragic for many reasons. First, because it could have been avoided if our founding fathers had not allowed slavery to continue to exist. Also because the war dragged on so long because of its great loss of life, but also because it literally pitted families against one another. One such story involves the two brothers, James and Alexander Campbell. These men had immigrated uh, to the United States from Scotland in the 1850s. Uh, James permanently resigned, run up to a militia unit in Charleston, and Alexander became part of one in New York. And both men quickly got caught up in this conflict that wreaked havoc on the nation. In 1862, the city of Charleston was under attack by the Union. And there, at the Battle of Secessionville, the two brothers' units were drawn up against each other during the fight. In a heated part of that battle, Alex, a color sergeant for the North, picked up the U.S. flag and boldly planted it atop a wall of the Confederate fort. He did this despite withering fire coming from the Confederate army, and he held that position until he was ordered to retreat. Little did he expect that later in that same battle, at a critical moment when the Confederate resistance was about to collapse, his own brother James would jump on top of the same wall, roll a log down into the Union troops, and fire a musket into their midst. They didn't miss staring each other in the face by much. The brothers later found out what had happened. James wrote to his brother, I was astonished to hear from the prisoners that you was color bearer of the regiment that assaulted the battery at this point the other day. I was doing my best to beat you, but I hope you and I will never again meet face to face bitter enemies on the battlefield. And the Charleston Courier wrote that this was, quote, another illustration of the deplorable consequences of this fratricidal war, meaning war, brother fighting against brother. Despite the horror of this moment, providentially, each man was spared the choice of pulling the trigger. God survived the war. The fact that they squared off that day was a shocking realization for the brothers and a sad result of the conflict itself. And the divisive result and the ripple effects of the Civil War have lasted long after that day, even into the present time. Our passage this morning looks at another tragic conflict between brothers, Jacob and Esau. It's a conflict that on both sides was the result of sin and ambition and previous division within the family. This is not new, and we'll, we'll see that here as well, that God providentially was at work orchestrating His plan in spite of and even through the sinful actions of men. Violence between brothers was a clear threat in this passage. But again, by God's grace, by God's grace both men survived the immediate conflict. However... The ripple effects of this conflict in this family would outlast their lives for many generations. The descendants of Esau and Jacob would hate and fight and even kill each other for many years as a result of the events that we'll look at today. So let's read our passage together, chapter 26. And I want you to pick up just in verse 34, right at the end of that chapter. I'll explain why later. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as his wives Judith, daughter of Beeri the Hethite, and Bezamath, daughter of Elon the Hethite. They, uh, they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. Chapter 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. She's eavesdropping. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me. Curse my son. Just obey me. 
So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother, and his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of her older son Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son Jacob. When he came to his father, he said, My father. And he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Eat some of them that you may bless me. He said to his son, he said to Jacob, my son, Esau. Jacob, his father Isaac, when he t- the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Again, he asked, are, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. Then he said, bring it closer to me and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him, and he ate. He brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow and worship to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow and worship to you. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. Notice this is the transfer of the promises that have been given to Abraham and then to Isaac, and now he thinks to Esau. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau arrived from his hunting. He had also made some delicious food and brought it to his father. He said to his father, Let my father get up and eat some of his son's game so that you may bless me. But his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? He answered, I am Esau, your firstborn son. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then, he said, who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it all before you came in and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed cried out with loud cry and said to his father, Bless me too, my father. But he replied, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. So he said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me twice now. He took my birthright and look, now he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you saved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered Esau, Look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants, and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What then can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. His father Isaac answered him, Look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you rebel, you will break his yoke from your neck. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When the words of her older son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son. So listen to me at once to my brother John, and stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hethite girls. If Jacob marries someone from around here, like these Hethite girls, speaking of Esau's wives, what good is my life? This is a heart-wrenching story, isn't it? It feels like a soap opera. And this is not how families should relate to one another. There should not be division between brothers, division between husbands and wives, plotting behind one another's backs, using each other for material gain, and threats of murder within families. This should be a reminder for us again of the deep results of the fall, going all the way back to Genesis 3, how how corrupt humanity has become. There are echoes of Cain and Abel in this story. But this tragic division in the family of Isaac the patriarch did not have its origin in this chapter. Last week we saw while they were in the womb, they were wrestling with each other. But there's really a seed for this division that starts with their parents. We already saw it. Esau, expert hunter and outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. 
Isaac, listen closely, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. That's what he liked to eat. But Rebecca loved Jacob. See the division right there? Particular son over against the other. And so last week we saw elements of conflict between the brothers themselves in the sale of the birthright. It wasn't actual sale, but you could tell in that moment uh, Esau is, 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 uh, is exhausted and Jacob takes advantage of him. And then it says Esau despises his birthright. So there's, there's lingering bitterness because of what we saw last week. And in today's passage, the parents themselves are caught up right in the thick of this conflict, contributing to this problem, coming up with devious plans. So their favoritism is on even greater display, making it an even stronger warning to us. And that's our first point of application. Family favoritism brings division and grief. Playing favorites within the family brings division and grief. Now typically, growing up, as you study this passage for me, it was the case that, that, that we often focus on Rebecca and Jacob's guilt. Right? Because they're the ones who enact Rebecca's shopping. She makes, and she and Jacob are conniving uh, and telling, uh, Jacob is telling his father several outright lies to deceive his father and to steal from his brother. And they are surely guilty. However, I do not believe that Isaac and Esau are innocent in this story either. First, Esau, we saw at the very beginning, he has not been acting like a firstborn son should, especially the firstborn son of a patriarch who has received such important blessings from God, covenant blessings. This family was to be greatly blessed by God. They were to be a blessing to others. God was going to make them into a great nation, the nation from which our Savior would come. Those promises have been given. I will bless all peoples through you. So because of that, they were to be set apart, right? They were to be different from the godless people around them. You may have wondered why I read those two verses about Esau's wives. Well, think back. Do you remember all the trouble Abraham went to to find the right wife for Isaac? Remember? He had that servant come in, swear that serious oath, and go. He said, do not find a wife for my son who's like the peoples around me. Go back to my family. Bring back a woman of character. Bring back a woman who will help him walk with the Lord. And he did that through Rebecca. Well, at the beginning of this account, we saw that Esau took not one, but two Hethite wives. The Hethites were the people around them. In fact, when Abraham bought the plot of land to bury uh, Sarah, his wife, it was from the Hethites. And then, of course, Abraham himself is buried in that same spot. So this person was not, or these two women were not from their relatives. They were from the surrounding nations. And twice in the passage we just read, Scripture shows how terrible these wives made life for Esau's parents. You can insert an in-law joke here. I'm not going to do that because I have great in-laws, and they watch this live stream, so I have wonderful in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> either Isaac or Esau or both have sinned here. Perhaps Isaac, by not being as diligent as his own father was about his marriage. About, he, he didn't lead his, well, his son well in that, perhaps. Perhaps he did, and Esau just ignored but he made a porch. He chose two wives, which I've already explained. We see a lot of polygamy in Scripture, and the Bible shows us over and over again, it's not God's plan. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, singular, and they shall become one flesh. Anytime you see a major character in a polygamous relationship, it goes poorly, and this is another example of that. That's what Scripture's showing us. So the point is this. Esau is not living up to the standard of the son of promise in this family that is in covenant with God himself. By his own choices, Esau is fulfilling the prophecy that was made about him and Jacob while they were still in the womb. He did it in last week's passage, not caring very much about this birthright and selling it for a pot of soup. And now he's choosing poorly again with his wives. That prophecy from God in Genesis 25, 23 said that the older son would serve the younger. That was God's will. And Esau, the older son, has consistently shown spite for the firstborn blessings. Worst of all, in selling his birthright in chapter 25. The selling of that birthright brings us to the next thing that I believe Isaac and Esau are doing that is wrong. There's been a prophecy from God himself that Jacob, the younger son, 
would be in a position of authority over his older brother, right? Not only that, Esau specifically sold his birthright. Although it was an unjust price, it was a legal transaction. They exchanged it. He agreed to it. So in a legal sense, he is no longer the firstborn son. I find it very hard to believe that Isaac didn't know about that. I find it very hard to believe that Isaac didn't know about the prophecy that had been given before they were born, that Jacob would be in a position of authority. So get this. Isaac and Esau are trying to undo what God has already said and what Esau has already sold away. The blessings of the firstborn have already changed hands, both through God's prophecy and through Esau's own choice in selling his birthright. So when I learned this story growing up, I often thought of the birthright and the blessing as two separate things. Right? Well, he saw the birthright, but he saw the blessing, and, and then later Jacob came and stole that. No, they're really two parts of the same thing. Birth, the blessing. Because you're the these blessings that confer authority and a greater inheritance and leadership in the, within the family, and the covenant promises passed down from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 16, 16 and 17. And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing... He was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. In giving up the birthright, he lost the blessing. They come together. So, even though the exchange has already been made, and though God has made his will clear before they were even born, Isaac calls in Esau and tells him the time for the blessing has come, and he does so privately. In this culture, it was very common that this would be a big public event. The passing on of the blessings since the father thinks he's about to die. In fact, uh, there would often be blessings for many sons, or all their sons, but just a primary blessing given to the firstborn son. We'll see this when we get to Genesis 49. Jacob is about to die, and he, meets, and he gives a blessing to all of his sons. And actually, some of them are not blessings really at all. They're judgments. So th it was a very public thing in that instance. When you read the words that Isaac speaks in this blessing, listen, words that he thinks he's giving to Esau, it becomes very clear. He's trying to get around God's prophecy, and Esau is trying to get around the sale of the birthright. God has already said in the prophecy, the older will serve the younger, but Isaac says in his blessing, be master over your relatives. May your son, mother's sons bow and worship to you. That's why they're in the wrong. Now we know that God is working in and over all of this as part of his sovereign plan to choose Jacob as the son of promise, but Isaac is still responsible for his actions and words. And he intends those words for Esau. He is directly contradicting God's revealed will for Jacob, and in the rest of the blessing, he intentionally designates greater family wealth for Esau, despite the legal sale of the birthright that Esau has made. He's trying to salvage that status as firstborn son. The word biblical commentary puts it this way. Isaac's will is pitted against God's and Rebekah's. And sadly, his will seems to be governed, at least to some degree, by things as shallow as what kind of food he likes. He's being guided by his stomach. Does that sound familiar? What did we talk about last week? Esau, selling the birthright, because he was hungry. And I showed you in Philippians 3 where Paul says there are those whose God is fond in this instance. Great heartache and grief and even the threat of violence was the result of the favoritism in this family. Can you imagine what their marriage was like after this? By the way, Isaac thinks he might die soon. He lives at least 20 more years. What was that family dynamic like <laughs> after this story? And the violent results between the nations that came from Jacob and Esau's descendants would be devastating. The family division that started with favoritism set up Isaac and Esau on one side and Rebekah and Jacob in opposition on the other. Parents, don't let this favoritism start in your family. Don't let ease of relationship through shared interests cause you to draw closer to one child to the neglect of other children. If you do, those other children will see themselves as failures through your eyes. A big theme in Genesis is this, this issue of favoritism within families. Jacob, in a few chapters, will marry, make, again, polygamous relationship, and he favors one, life, one wife over the other. 
And then he favors the two sons from that wife after she's deceased over the others. And it results in one of those sons being sold into slavery. And this is an ongoing thing. Scripture's warning us. This is easy to do. It's easy to wake up one day and you realize you live in a house divided. By God's grace, guard your family. Guard your marriage from this. Guard your words, mom and dad. Guard your actions. It doesn't mean you'll deal with every kid the same way. It doesn't mean you'll even deal with, with every, that, that kid the same way the rest of their whole life. Sometimes it requires different approaches and different times in their lives. But be fair to your kids. They're watching closely all the time. And most of all, guard your hearts from this favoritism and division. That's where it starts. Pray to the Lord to help you love your kids faithfully and equally. Much hatred and strife and conflict and even death from this family division happens over hundreds of years of Old Testament history. The Edomites and the Israelites fought. One time David is in a battle against the Edomites and there's 18,000 of them that he kills in battle as they're attacking him. The book of, whole book of Obadiah is written by a Jewish prophet to the Edomites condemning them for the way they would rejoice in Judah's destruction by the Babylonians. The division and favoritism in Isaac's family would have horrific consequences and the guilt is on both sides. The two who choose to deliberately deceive and the two who tried to give the blessing to the wrong person, to the person who no longer had a claim to it until the deception fooled him into giving it to Jacob after all. Deception, especially with those that we love, can have devastating consequences. There was a terrible instance, instance of this during World War II that I read about recently. I know I already gave one war illustration, but this sermon is about a family conflict, <laughs> and this story isn't really that much about a battle. I want you to hear this. In 1943, in the Italian port city of Bari, that city had just been taken over by the Allies. The Italian military was collapsing, and the Nazis had not mounted much of an air attack in a while. There were many ships there in the harbor, Allied ships, American, British ships. One secret piece of cargo was on an American ship. This piece of cargo violated Geneva Conventions. After World War I, the Treaty of Geneva had said, chemical warfare is not to be used by any nation in war. Well, Allied higher-ups had actually lied to people below them about what was on this ship. There was a canister of mustard gas. You may have heard of mustard gas being used in World War I, thousands and thousands of lives being lost when it was used. The Allies had held a supply of mustard gas in reserve in case Hitler, as his back was increasingly against the wall, would decide to use chemical warfare. So FDR had said, look, you use it, we're going to use triple the amount you use to try to keep Hitler from using it. So we had some in a little complacent about security in this port. So there was a sudden unexpected air raid, which in 20 minutes had a huge impact, including hitting that ship where the mustard gas was stored and, and secretly hidden. The canister was destroyed, and it spread this highly toxic compound throughout the water. And then there's many men in the water as ships are destroyed and they're jumping off. The problem was this. Because of the deception with their own soldiers, doctors and nurses in the hospital were unable to treat these patients appropriately. And in fact, their condition got worse uh, because they didn't respond quickly and get them to change their clothes and things like that. And many, many of these soldiers died after having been exposed to it. The source of their suffering was a completely baffling mystery to the doctors in the hospital. Until Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander, a doctor who had become a soldier, had been trained, who had been trained in the effects of chemical warfare, was sent there. He was sent to Bari to solve the medical mystery. Pretty quickly, he was suspicious. He's like, I recognize these symptoms. I think this is mustard. And he started asking people above him, is there mustard gas stored here? And he was flatly told no multiple times. But he kept seeing where the signs pointed. He kept chasing it down. And then a diver in the harbor pulled up a piece of the very type of canister that he knew was used by Marasworth. Even then, for decades after, the military hid and denied the truth about that. Of course, in that moment, they didn't want to give Hitler a pretext to start using chemical warfare. But their deception resulted in the suffering and loss of many on their own side. Unnecessary lives lost. Hurting their own cause. 
And that leads us to our second point regarding the deliberate deception by Rebecca and Jacob. Deceit dishonors Christ and curses the deceiver. Look with me at the words Jacob uses before he tricks his father. His mother, Rebecca, is preparing him, prepping him, getting him ready to to work out the plot that she's hatched. And Jacob is concerned. He starts to running the what-ifs in his mind. In that conversation, both Jacob and Rebecca make very revealing statements. Look at chapter 27, verse 11. He says, Jacob, uh, he says, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me. Then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. So he's saying, uh, Mom, how's this going to work? <laughs> Dad is blind, yes, but he very likely will touch my skin. And Esau's name means hairy for a reason. He was hairy as a newborn. <laughs> okay, I'm not. If Dad touches my skin, he'll know it's me. And then he says this striking statement, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver. He knows what he's doing. And in fact, he's living up to his name. Remember? Remember the meaning of that name? So Jacob knows what he's doing. He knows the role he's taking on. And he knows that he's maliciously taking advantage of his blind father to take something from his own brother with the plan crafted by his mother. It's nasty stuff, not the way we should treat anybody, much less our own family. And the low point, in my opinion, in Jacob's actions takes place in verse 20. Look at it with me. Isaac's surprised that his son has returned so soon, but of course, Jacob had to get in and get out before Esau showed up. Verse 20, but Isaac said to his son, how did you ever find it so quickly, my son? He replied, because the Lord your God made it happen for me. That's not, that's not a good idea. Don't drag God into this. It's never a good thing to use God's name and, you know, with false piety, honor God's goodness and provision as you're deceiving someone. Jacob greatly dishonors the Lord here, just as you and I do when we claim his name, when we say we're Christians, and then we speak dishonestly or deceive someone or sin against the Lord. When we live one way on Sunday morning and another way the rest of the week, that's this kind of action. Oh, God, oh, God made it happen for me. That's what he says next. It's disgraceful. The Lord, your God, made it happen for me. And in my opinion, the, the, the word your is significant there as well. Because at this point, I don't, and this is a little bit of conjecture on my part, but I don't think Jacob has a real relationship with God yet. The Lord, your God. He doesn't say the Lord, my God. I also, you know, that'll make more sense next week when we come to the passage we're looking at there, which I think if you can find a point of conversion in Jacob's life, it's in the next week's passage where he comes and sees the ladder and, and says, if you'll do these things, you will be my God. I think that's his moment of conversion. So I don't think he knows the Lord yet here. And so he says, the Lord your God made it happen for me. Jacob's words greatly dishonor the Lord. So the application here for us is instead to be people of our word. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. As a Christian, you should have a reputation that you are as good as your word. People should be able to count on you. Keep your commitments. Be faithful to your spouse. Keep your promises. And of course, Christians must not intentionally deceive someone, as Jacob did here. It really often comes down to a faith issue. Do you trust God to provide for you, to take care of things you're worried about? Or will you take matters into your own hands and deceive someone to get what you want or what you think you need? Honor Christ by trusting Him, by choosing to be a person who speaks the truth in love, even if it looks like it will hurt you in the short term on this earth. That's what faith is about. Trusting God in the long term to take care of you. When you do that, you'll be rewarded. Trust him. Speak the truth. One last thing about this deception. Jacob and Rebekah's words in verses 12 and 13 are particularly telling. After Jacob says that his smooth skin may reveal him as a deceiver, Jacob says what he knows will be the result of such an instance. He says, I will bring a curse on myself instead of a blessing. And what's Rebecca say? Shockingly, she acknowledges this and says, I'll bear any curse placed on you. Your curse be on me, my son. She is willing, she says, to bear any retribution on Jacob. I think what she means is, I'll I'll take care of your father. I'll deal with him. The ends to which their family division and greed have taken them are dark indeed. And the reality is this. They are both cursed. 
Cursed for this deceit? Cursed for many other sinful actions. The curse of sin is upon both of them. The Bible says that the wages or the payment of sin is death. And although we have seen that God is working out his sovereign plan to choose Jacob and bless him with his covenant blessings, it is true that Jacob was guilty for his sin here and deserved to die as a result of this sin. The curse of sin is real for every one of us. We all deserve to die for our sin. But Rebecca was mistaken about one thing. She could not bear this curse for Jacob. None of us can pay the price for someone else. She could not take the curse of sin for him. She had her own sin. But amazingly, gloriously, there is one who not only could take the curse, but did. That leads us to our last point this morning. Number three, God is the God of Jacob and other deceivers. He's the God of Jacob and other people like him, all of us. (laughs) When Esau realizes the depth of his brother's treachery, he screams in anguish. Isaac, the old man, trembles uncontrollably. It's, it's, it's painful to read. They've been deceived by their own flesh and blood. And Esau's words in verse 36 are gripping. Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He's cheated me twice now. He took my birthright, and look, now he has taken my blessing. Of course, as I said earlier, Esau's also at fault with, with the birthright for making such a poor exchange. But in this case, he's been the victim of open deceit. And it refers to Jacob's name, which was given when he came out of the womb, grabbing his brother's heel. He who grasps the heel. Or it could be translated supplanter, overreacher, deceiver. Jacob lived up to his name. And yet, and yet, we will see next week, and you can see it in passage after passage in the Old Testament, that God calls himself the God of Abraham and and Jacob. In fact, the corporate prayer that we just prayed from Psalm 46, just twice. Here's one from verse of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And then it says Selah, which means meditate. And I think it's probably pointing us back to that word. The God of the deceiver is our stronghold. Names are important in the Bible. And even though later God will rename Jacob to be called Israel, in a few chapters we'll see that, Don't you think it's significant that God says, your name will be Israel, and then throughout much of the Old Testament, he says, I'm the God of Jacob. I think we're supposed to notice that, that God chooses to call himself that. You could literally say from this phrase, from Psalm 46, and in this passage, that God is the God of the deceiver. That sounds pretty bad at first, doesn't it? But it points us straight to the gospel God is the God who bears the sin of deceivers like Jacob and deceivers like you and deceivers like me. He's the God who bears the sin of all of us. Rebecca couldn't do it. She couldn't bear this curse of sin for her son Jacob, but Jesus did. He removed the curse of sin. Listen to Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He hung on that piece of wood. He hung on that tree to pay for our sin. And then once God has paid the price for the sin of deceivers like Jacob, he doesn't leave them as deceivers. Listen, he's the God of Jacob, but he doesn't leave Jacob like he is. See that especially next week. Jacob and other deceivers like us are changed by the gospel. He changes Jacob the deceiver into Jacob the man of God. We'll see that over the next coming weeks. God redeems him, makes amazing promises to him, and then keeps those promises, blessing him and changing his heart and character, making him a blessing to others, making his life honorable to the Lord. God enters into a very close, intimate relationship with Jacob out of his grace. And he builds from Jacob's family through 12 sons, the nation of Israel, through whom he sends Jesus to save all who will trust in him, including Jacob talked about this before. Just like we look back to Jesus and the cross and all that he did, Old Testament saints were saved by faith as well. They didn't know the name Jesus. They didn't know about a cross, but they were trusting in God's coming redemption. Abraham 2, Genesis 15, 6. He believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Jesus, Jacob's descendant, is the only way Jacob can be saved. God steps into the situation with Jacob's sin and he does a work of grace and renewal. You remember the story I told you about with the mustard gas and Lieutenant Colonel Alexander's discovery of the truth? There's a part of the story I didn't tell you yet. 
years before he was in Italy. Alexander had noticed something in his studies on the effects of chemical warfare. In tests done on animals, he noticed that when they were exposed to mustard gas, their white blood cell counts dropped dramatically. At the time, he had wondered if this substance that had been used for death could somehow be used to fight cancer, especially leukemia, which has an overabundance of white blood cells. He had tried to chase down this research at that time in hopes of, hopes of a cure, but his superiors had said, no, you're here to, to research how we can protect soldiers from the effects of chemical warfare, and so he had to put it away. But in 1943, as he treated soldiers affected by the tragedy of Bari in Italy, he noticed the exact same phenomenon. Through blood tests, he saw what he had seen with those animals. For obvious reasons, he had never tested that theory on humans. But as these soldiers had gone through this, he noticed their white blood cells would drop off dramatically from the effect of the mustard gas. Now listen to the Smithsonian Magazine. Alexander could not save the worst of the Bari mustard gas casualties he knew, but perhaps he could make their deaths count for something. A one in a million chance had landed him. One of the few, it is an rare chance to investigation into the toxin's biological effects on the human body, the kind that would be impossible with living volunteers. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander worked feverishly to learn what he could from this disaster, and he passed his findings on to Dr. Cornelius Rhodes, head of New York's Memorial Hospital for the Treatment of Cancer and Allied Diseases. And Dr. Rhodes and his team took Alexander's work and other research and eventually ended up with an experimental treatment that we now There was deception and violence and tragedy. Soldiers and sailors died for their country, and we rightly mourn their loss. But in the midst of that, there came a treatment that has been used to save the lives of countless cancer patients. Out of tragedy, and even out of deception, came hope. God saved and forgave and changed Jacob the deceiver through his grace. Out of the tragedy of his deception and family division and the threat of violence, God brought hope. We'll see next week how faithful and gracious the Lord was to this man. And God wants to extend the same kind of grace to you. Whether you've already trusted in Jesus as Savior or not. If you've never trusted in Him, you're still an enemy of others. He wants to reach down and change your life as He did Jacob's. Not based on you being a good person. None of us are good enough. But based on His wonderful and kind grace. Repent and believe in Jesus. And if you're already a Christian, let him continue to change your heart, to make you less and less like the old you, and more and more like Jesus. By his grace, don't be a deceiver anymore. By his love, don't be prideful anymore. By his power, don't lust or commit sexual sin anymore. By his work in your heart, don't be consumed with fear and anxiety and worry, but be filled with faith. God has loved you in spite of those things and in spite of all your other sins to move you away and set you up holiness and love and purity and faithfulness. Praise God that he loves and saves and changes people like Jacob and people like you and me. Amen. Let's pray with me. Father, we thank you for this story of how you worked in Jacob's life. We'll see that over the next few chapters, Lord. Thank you that though he deceived greatly, you still loved him. You provided a way for his forgiveness. You extended your grace to him. And God, we believe that you have done that for us through Jesus. We did not deserve your salvation. We did not deserve to be with you forever in heaven. We did not deserve to be adopted in your family as your children. And yet you did it. You choose to be the God of people like us, like me and my sin. God, may any here who have not received your gracious forgiveness, may they do so this morning. Any who are watching online, may they do so now, turning from sin, turning to Jesus. And Father, for those of us who already know you, may we be changed by the gospel. Just like you changed Jacob, made him a new man and used him to raise up the nation through whom Jesus would come. You changed his character. God, may you do that in us. Keep us from deceit. Keep us from sin. Not in order to earn our way to you. We know we can't. But out of worship and thankfulness to you for the gospel, for the hope you've given us. 
God, we praise you for caring about us and redeeming us. Be glorified in our response to your word now. In Jesus' name, amen.